Okay, welcome everybody to the ADA and Website Accessibility Webinar. Uh, the webinar is brought to you by FBT Tech, um, just by way of background and introduction. Each month or so you can join us for webinars on current topics and trending issues. Uh, you can view past webinars uh, and you can stay informed of current and other issues relevant to the intersection of technology and law uh, by joining us at fbttech.com. Today, we have a um, pretty interesting webinar that I think will surprise a number of folks, at least in connection with the topic and, and what it might potentially mean to your business. As a roadmap, uh, we're going to start off with, again, background. What is the ADA? Uh, what does the ADA have to do with websites? Uh, from there, we're going to transition over, over to why you should care and kind of sizing the litigation risk associated with your website not being in compliance with the ADA. And then from there, we're going to present on what is website accessibility. So if you are to be uh, compliant with the ADA, what does that mean and what can you do right now? My name is Neil Patel. I am an attorney at Frost Brown Todd and chair of FBT Tech. Uh, joining me today is Steve Embry, one of my colleagues at FBT um, at Frost Brown Todd, who specializes in uh, litigation and particularly class action litigations. And we also have a guest speaker uh, from the Bureau of Internet Advertising, Kim Testa, who will be speaking to the last component on what website accessibility means and what businesses can do right now. We will uh, tie off the discussion with the Q&A. Uh, just a quick note on the Q&A, given the number of folks that are joining, uh, it would not work well to open the line for people to ask questions. So within the um, software that should be on your desktop and allowing you to join and see the slides, you will be able to ask questions uh, by typing them in. Uh, we will either address those questions during uh, the webinar or alternatively at the end. So please do send in your questions. Um, I think that a lot of lively, let's say, discussion can occur uh, through engagement and questions. So with that, let's kick it off on the background. The Americans with Disabilities Act. We all think about this law in the context of physical locations. Uh, the law itself simply says, and, and there are a number of other things, but as it applies to um, uh, our discussion today, that no individual shall be discriminated against on the basis of disability in the full enjoyment of the good services, facilities, privileges, advantages, or accommodations of any place of public accommodation. Now, I've highlighted the last part of that, any place of public accommodation. Again, we think about this in the context of brick and mortar locations, and that's traditionally where the enforcement activity, activity has occurred. So we think about wheelchair accessible ramps that allow people to access retail locations, uh, ATM machines incorporating Braille and other technology. Um, th that's kind of the context that we've kind of grown up with when thinking about the ADA. But as society and as we have progressed from a technology standpoint, um, we have become more and more reliant on technology, more and more reliant on digital interactions. And the obvious questions have come up as to whether websites must also comply with the ADA. The way this boils down uh, from a legal analysis perspective is on the highlighted point, which is our websites places of public accommodation. If we look at the language of the ADA, the ADA provides roughly 12 categories of, uh, of what it describes as places of public accommodation. I've included this Uber list in here, um, left out some parts of it, but just to give you an idea, if you, if you look at this list, um, it clearly seems to exclude websites, or maybe stated another way, it certainly doesn't reference websites. So if we're just looking at the ADA's definition of places of public accommodation, there is, at best, um, an open question. 
It's certainly not something that clearly references websites. All of the cited examples on, in the definition of uh, places of public accommodation um, seem to be examples that point to brick and mortar establishments. Uh, so it's not just that websites are not referenced, it seems that all of the examples that are referenced also reflect brick and mortar places. And if we want the proverbial smoking gun, we can look and see that, well, the ADA was passed in 1990. The first website was launched in August of 1991. So there's an obvious question as to whether the law covered something that didn't exist at the time. As a little treat, I decided to throw in for you an image of the very first website. So the World Wide Web and, and the listing there is actually a screen grab of the very first website that was launched in August of 1991. I put the source there. You can, you can go and peruse that on your own. But the point here is that, obviously, the ADA didn't contemplate websites. Um, and certainly, if it contemplated some form of electronic or digital communication platforms, it certainly did not envision websites of the type that we have today. And so a fair question exists as to whether the ADA, in fact, covers websites in the first place. Now, that said, there's always the other side to this. And the other side is that the committee report to the ADA clearly notes that the committee intends that the type of accommodations, services, provided to individuals with disabilities should keep pace with the rapidly changing technology of the time. So there was a intent on the part of the drafters to ensure that the ADA would keep pace with advances in technology. From a technical standpoint, the ADA also prohibits um, discrimination by covered entities, not by the places that are providing the accommodation. And it's in the enjoyment of the public place, not at. And so if you just kind of parse through the language, there are plenty of arguments that can point the other way, notwithstanding the fact that websites aren't listed in the 12 categories, uh, that point to saying that, you know what, the ADA should be more broadly construed. And then there's kind of the practical. Would, you know, would confining the application of the ADA to physical locations even work? Think about an uh, insurance salesman who happens to go door to door. What is offered by the insurance company in that instance, if we're only focused on physical locations, would potentially not be covered by the ADA. But the same policies that might be sold through a brick and mortar location for that insurance company would presumably fall within the parameters of the ADA. Um, so it, confining the ADA strictly to physical locations uh, tends to, I guess, fall apart when we think about examples like that. The arguments just aren't as persuasive. Now, where we have seen a good bit of activity here from a court perspective is um, the concept of physical location having some connection to the website operation. So courts have evaluated whether the ADA applies to websites, both from the standpoint of is it a website uh, that solely exists, um, meaning there is no physical part to the business itself. It's an online only business. And as we move along the spectrum to whether it applies to that, or must there be some physical location um, that is supported uh, by the website that's available? And then on the other end of the spectrum is, must it just be a physical location? So courts have evaluated this, and, and quite frankly, there is a split um, in, in those decisions as to whether the ADA applies, and if so, uh, uh, to what variety? Is it online only? 
Uh, is it online only plus physical locations with websites, or is it some uh, conclusion in between? Now, the DOJ uh, is important to consider, and certainly their, their perspective on this is, is given a fair bit of deference. The Department of Justice is the relevant federal agency tasked with enforcing the ADA. Um, they have concluded that websites must be accessible to consumers with disabilities. Uh, they have pointed to certain guidelines, uh, the WCAG guidelines that are published by the World Wide Web Consortium, and Kim is going to talk in more detail about what those are a little bit later in the presentation. But the DOJ, through settlements and um, that have been initiated or come about as a result of enforcement actions, has essentially agreed um, to adopting the WCGA for those settlement purposes, meaning that those companies that were targeted, um, they have entered into settlement agreements which state that they will comply with the accessibility guidelines uh, of the WCAG. Now, there's no formal adoption of the WCAG guidelines uh, for purposes of setting forth the standards on accessibility. Because once we conclude, if the conclusion is to be had that websites must be accessible to consumers with disabilities, the natural question is, okay, well, what does that mean? Um, how is a website or how can a website become compliant um, or at least become accessible to those with dis disabilities. And that's where the WCAG guidelines come in uh, to play. They are a set of guidelines which reflect uh, accessibility for websites. Um, back in July of 2010, the D DOJ, having not adopted any clear guidelines on what accessibility means, um, issued a notice of proposed rulemaking to establish specific requirements. And the DOJ in the relevant documents noted that a clear requirement that provides covered entities clear guidance on what is required under the ADA does not exist. So while the DOJ has been party to agreements, uh, settlement agreements, consent decrees where businesses agree to comply with the WCAG guidelines, there is acknowledgment um, by the DOJ that the WCAG guidelines are not necessarily uh, the only way in which to come into compliance with uh, the ADA. And in fact, there may be other ways in which businesses can come into compliance. That was the idea behind uh, the notice of proposed rulemaking. Now, unfortunately, the DOJ has put off uh, issuing any guidelines under the proposed rulemaking uh, for quite some time. Most recently, um, at the beginning of 2016, or maybe it was December of 2015, the DOJ put off that until 2018. And so don't expect anything, um, uh, any clear guidance coming from the DOJ anytime soon on this. Look, all of this discussion, we have to acknowledge at this point, is somewhat academic. Uh, certainly it's academic from the standpoint of uh, evaluating risks in operating businesses and determining whether websites must be compliant with the ADA. Because the reality of it is, is each of the brands that are listed on this site have been targeted, have been sued, or have been issued cease and desist letters. Actually, I think all of these entities have been sued um, in class actions or individual actions um, where the claim by the plaintiffs is that their sites do not comply with the ADA. Uh, there are literally uh, hundreds more um, cases that are brewing or that have actually been filed um, uh, focus just on this issue. So the reason why I say it's academic is that <clears throat> at the end of the day, uh, um, whether the ADA technically applies to websites or not is something that's going to be finally determined at some point. But in the interim, businesses are facing risk. At a minimum, the risk is having to deal with defense costs associated with lawsuits being filed. In addition, um, cease and desist letters have been uh, issued throughout 2015 and continue into 2016 by a number of plaintiffs' class action attorneys 
Um, so either you may have received it as part of your business. We certainly have had clients that have received cease and desist letters essentially stating that their websites are not in compliance with the ADA and that they must comply with the WCAG guidelines um, and demanding essentially or proposing a settlement uh, to resolve all of the issues. Of course, without identifying any individual that has specifically been harmed, um, the request is that settlement agreements be entered along with num a number of conditions including uh, compliance with the WCAG, regular audits and reports, and things of that sort. Now, the ADA does provide for the recovery of attorney's fees, and that is certainly a part of the cease and desist that are being sent out. Steve Embry, who I'm going to hand off to here in a moment, is going to talk about uh, some of the, the risk from a litigation perspective. But let me summarize where we are and where businesses are. The ADA is silent on its application to websites. There are no applicable or final DOJ regulations which set forth what website accessibility means. Circuit courts are split on whether the ADA applies to websites, and even those courts that have concluded that the ADA does apply to websites have not identified any specific accessibility requirements um, that are required under law. So essentially, as a business, you're left trying to make sense of all of this and figure out, well, gee, if I want to operate a website and I really don't want to be open to litigation, putting aside the fact that it's not been finally determined whether the ADA applies to websites, but if you're a business, you want to know how best to avoid risk. Uh, unfortunately, at this point, there are few options uh, to avoiding risk. Um, one risk, of course, is to come into compliance with the WCAG guidelines, or excuse me, one approach is to come into uh, compliance with the WCAG guidelines. And there may be some other approaches, but at the end of the day, none of these are going to uh, necessarily be conclusive in um, pulling away the risk that might exist. With that, I am going to hand it off to Steve Embry to talk about the litigation risk. Thank you, Neil. Uh, it's a pleasure to, to be here and to be talking about this subject. Um, I want to talk a few minutes about uh, ADA website compliance and risk, and in particular, the litigation risk. Because what you may want to do about this problem will depend in large part on how you assess the risk of claims and lawsuits against you. In talking about this, it's important to reiterate a few of the things Neil said, but to put them in a little bit different context, a litigation context. Again, by way of background, the Americans with Disabilities Act was passed in 1990, and it was designed to ensure that those with certain physical or mental challenges would not be discriminated against in places of public accommodation. Mainly, it ensures that those with physical challenges can have access to those places, and that those who provide places of public accommodation do provide reasonable means of access. Uh, by way of, again, by way of background and context, uh, I like to think of things in terms of who was president. And in 1990, when the act was passed, George Bush was president, only it was George H. Bush. So that gives you an idea of how long ago that was. The act, of course, was passed well before the internet and website usage became as ubiquitous as it is now and was mainly directed toward brick and mortar facilities. But like a lot of things, the law has not caught up with the technology. So there exists this awkward mismatch between a 1990 law and today's internet use, and there are a lot of questions for which there are unfortunately not very clear answers. And where there are not very clear answers, the legal risk becomes magnified. So again, the first question in any litigation will be, are websites places of public accommodation that must comply with the ADA requirements or not? The ADA is silent. Uh, it does list categories that Neil mentioned that are places of public accommodation. And of course, the internet is not mentioned. So what's the answer from a legal perspective to this question? Well, some courts say, yes, a website is a place of public accommodation. 
In a case involving Netflix in federal court in Massachusetts, the court said, quote, it would be irrational to conclude that persons who enter an office to purchase services are protected by the ADA, but persons who purchase the same services over the telephone or by mail are, or by mail are not. Congress could not have intended such an absurd result, end quote. Ironically, one month later in a federal court in California, the court held that the same Netflix website was not a place of public accommodation. And there were similar findings in fa the Facebook and Southwest Air litigation. According to the 11th Circuit, the 11th quote, the 11th Circuit has recognized Congress's clear intent that the ADA governs solely access to physical, concrete places of public accommodations, end quote. So on the one hand, you have a court saying it's irrational and absurd that websites are not considered places of public accommodation. And on the other hand, you have a court saying Congress's clear intent was that websites not be so considered. It is tempting, of course, to conclude that this is an example of America's ju judicial system clearly running amok. And yet there's a third option that uh, Neil mentioned, and that is places of, uh, websites may be places of public accommodations in certain situations. In some cases involving uh, such retailers as Target, federal courts in California and Massachusetts have said that the Internet is a place of public accommodation only if there is a suitable nexus between the website and physical stores. While more and more courts are going in this direction, what will constitute the necessary nexus and what this means has also not been fully fleshed out, creating yet another unanswerable question and risk. And by the way, if you're keeping score, the first, second, and seventh federal circuits say yes, internet, internet is a place of public accommodations. The fifth, ninth, and by inference, the sixth circuit have said no, the internet is not. So while you might be tempted to think whether, whether you are at risk depends on where you ge geographically find yourself, Given the national reach of internet webs and websites, you may be said to find yourself lots of places. So whether a particular jurisdiction's law applies often hinges on whether you conduct business there. And if your website is seen or used by customers or people in a jurisdiction, you may very well be said to conduct business in that jurisdiction. So let's assume your website is a place of public accommodation and the ADA applies. What's required? The short answer is uh, it's not known. Uh, there is no uh, law or regulations that are in effect, and there won't be until at the very least, least 2018. That makes uh, resolving these cases uh, in any way that fully protects you very difficult. And while we do have some guidelines, which Neil mentioned, the world, uh, the web content accessibility guidelines, uh, which have been adopted by the DLG, DOJ, these are not uh, mandated by law. They are guidelines, and compliance with them do not, does not ensure that you can't be sued for uh, even if you comply with them. So what's the bottom line from a litigation perspective? You don't really know if you have to comply with the ADA, and if you do, you don't really know what you have to comply with. Even if you follow the guidelines, that does not provide you a silver bullet from a claim in a lawsuit saying you're not providing the reasonable access contemplated by the ADA. All of this creates uncertainty. With uncertainty comes risk. And, as you might expect, here come the lawyers. One law firm, Carlson and Lynch in Pittsburgh, uh, whose named partners are Bruce Carlson and Gary Lynch, the handsome guys on the screen there, have filed 93 lawsuits so far, all in uh, most in, in Pittsburgh or the Federal District Court in Pittsburgh, against a wide variety of companies that Neil mentioned. And these guys have sent countless demand letters to companies all over the United States. One of their clients, a guy named Robert Jehota, has himself filed 66 lawsuits. Uh, Mr. Jehoda, unfortunately, is blind, and his allegations are that his disability prevents him from obtaining access. So what do uh, Bruce and Gary and uh, other lawyers of their ilk really want? 
The first thing they want is an injunction, an injunction which would force you to comply with the WCAG guidelines. But more than that, they want a consultant that they approve to come into your business, look at your website, and make sure it complies, and then monitor it on an ongoing basis, at your expense, of course. Now, I don't know what an approved consultant like this would charge, but my guess is it would not be cheap. Not to mention the disruption. Does it make you uneasy that an outside consultant that plaintiff's lawyers approve would be nosing around your business and website on an ongoing basis? What does he or she get to see? What protections would there be in place to keep them out of confidential material? What else do uh, Gary and Bruce want? They, of course, want you to pay their legal fees, which the ADA, ADA allows if there's a violation. Again, I don't know what these handsome fellows would charge, but they certainly don't look cheap. And a couple of other things of late that they have been demanding. One is they've hinted at the ability to recover damages, and they have attempted to certify uh, classes which increase the exposure, which I'll get to in just a moment. But let's talk about the damage element for a moment. You may wonder, how in the world can damages be recovered, and what are they? Now, the ADA itself does provide for the recovery of compensatory damages, but it's only in limited circumstances. If the discrimination is intentional or if the conduct is deter determined to stem from a deliberate indifference to the rights of the disabled plaintiff. The ADA, though, is really more directed at compliance. But Bruce and Gary have figured a clever way around this. Most websites collect and maintain data about how their sites are accessed. That's generally okay since most websites contain privacy policies and guidelines which set out what's going to be collected and how that information might be used. But Bruce and Gary say, if I'm physically challenged, I may not see or be aware of those privacy policies and can't be said to have consented to the collection and use of the information. And without that consent, there may be various statutory penalties that come into play depending on how the information is used, and more importantly, if the information can be said to be personally identifiable information, or PII. If it's PII, arguably PII, or by inference becomes PII through someone obtaining other data, then onerous statutory penalties come into play. And the definition of PII is evolving as well. A recent federal district court decision uh, broke ranks with other federal district courts that have pondered the PII issue and found for the first time that device identifiers that by themselves do not identify their user but which can be linked with other information by a third party to name a particular person do in fact constitute PII. And moreover, different states define PII differently. Bruce and Gary actually men mentioned some of the penalty statutes that they have in mind in their demand letters that they've been circulating. There are, for example, state laws precluding unfair and deceptive acts and practices that could come into play. These little FTC acts, as they are known, can contain definitions of what is considered unfair and deceptive that can be quite broad. Bruce and Gary cite this fact and two other acts in their letter. The two other statutes in their letter, the Can Spam Act and the Telephone Consumer Protective Act, as examples of statutes that contain designated penalties that the plaintiffs, not the government, but the plaintiffs can recover, depending on how and what information is used if there is no consent. Now, while some of this may change with the Supreme Court decision later this year in the Robbins case, but for, for now, that is the law. So how much are these penalties? Well, they are per violation, which can add up, but more importantly, they can be recovered through the use of a class action. Now, most of you are probably familiar with class actions, but for those are not, who are not, a class action uh, allows a representative plaintiff to prosecute not only his own claim, but the claims of others who are similarly situated. To do so, there must be a common issue, the resolution of which will bind all in the class because they are indeed similarly situated. So what does this mean? If there is one common issue, for example, whether the ADA has been violated, whether a website is a place of public accommodation, that may be enough for a class certification. 
And if a class is certified, all the claims for damages for all the class members are aggregated together, which of course increases the exposure many fold and leads to an expensive and lengthy uh, litigation. So while on the one hand most people would consider a class action a curse, on the other hand in this situation there may be some blessing associated with a class action because it allows you to settle with the class and thereby preclude future claims of class members. So as here, uh, where what you have to do to comply with the ADA is not entirely clear, it does provide a proverbial silver bullet at a cost, of course, by which you can protect yourself against a future claim that you didn't do enough or if future regulations change what's required. So to sum up, who's really at risk? Clearly, there is some risk to anyone with a public website, as one of the Netflix cases demonstrates. And given the national reach of the Internet, where you are may not protect you. Secondly, anyone with a brick-and-mortar facility that also operates a, next, a website to which there may be some sort of nexus, for example, you can order goods uh, on the, through the Internet, through the website, and then pick them up at the store, uh, are also at risk and probably at higher risk. Third, if you collect or use or share information and data gleaned from the website, your risk increases. And finally, if you collect, use, or share personally identifiable information, your risk is higher still. And again, keep in mind that what constitutes personally identifiable information is evolving, subject to interpretation, and defined differently under different states' law. But how you deal with all these potential claims and what you can do proactively depends in part on where you fall on the risk matrix and how risk tolerant you are. So let's turn next to what you can do now to help your position and either forestall litigation or be better positioned if it comes. I'd like to turn it back to Neil and to Kim to walk through some of these challenging issues. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. So um, we're going to turn over to Kim Testa, uh, who is at the Bureau of Internet Adver excuse me, <laughs> is at the BOIA, and um, she's going to cover off, as I mentioned before, what, what website accessibility means and what you can do in order to bring your site in compliance with um, uh, the ADA. There were a couple of questions that were presented, and I think it probably makes sense for me to quickly cover this off. The first question was, um, does it make a difference if your website is informational versus e-commerce? Uh, the answer to that is um, the, the answer that most lawyers like to provide, well, it depends. As a bright line, no, it does not make a difference. The question is whether the content or the purpose of the site, regardless, um, uh, are, are such that they, they are necessary to, to enjoy uh, or, or capture the full benefit of um, the goods and services that are provided by that given entity. So there certainly would be instances where informational sites provide uh, a level of information that um, enhances the enjoyment, um, provides advantages um, uh, to, to, to doing business with a particular company uh, that if the disabled did not have access to uh, would certainly be to their disadvantage. So the short answer is, is a bright line, no. Uh, informational versus e-commerce, that is not something that, um, that, that is, is a singular factor. The second question was, um, given the nature uh, or given the DOJ's position, is it really unsettled, and I think the question here, is it really unsettled as to whether the ADA applies uh, to websites? Um, and essentially to take that position seems more than risky, uh, would probably agree with this. You know, whether it's settled is a matter of whether the law actually requires it, and notwithstanding the DOJ's position, uh, there certainly are arguments that the ADA uh, does not apply to websites or at least certain types of websites, and that the DOJ's position on this is beyond the scope. So. Certainly, um, there are those arguments, but from a practical perspective, um, and as I uh, had mentioned earlier, it's somewhat academic at this point. Uh, the DOJ is certainly of the opinion that websites must be in compliance with the ADA, and uh, plaintiffs class actions uh, take a uh, plaintiffs class action attorneys take a similar position. 
So if the goal here is obviously to uh, comply with the law, but more importantly, avoid risk, um, this is one area in which businesses would be well served to uh, pay attention. With that, I'm going to hand it off to Kim Testa, um, and she will cover website accessibility and what businesses can do right now. Hi, thank you everybody. I'm Neil and Steve. Great introduction, a lot of really good information here. Um, my name is Kim Testa. I'm uh, the Executive Vice President here at the Bureau of Internet Accessibility. And um, Neil, I just need to have control of the screen. Oh, here we go. You've, here we go. You've got it. That. <laughs> I've got it right now. Okay, so you have all of this great information that Neil and Steve just presented on the legal side. So to, I'm going to augment to that. Um, just uh, what is website accessibility? Well, it literally is that whatever you're presenting online, that everybody, depend, not dependent upon their abilities, should be allowed to access your information. So that means that everybody should have... Um, inclusive practice of removing any barriers within your website that would stop or prevent anybody using assistive technologies to get to the information to make the purchases, to social media, to reading the newspaper. It's just everybody today depends on the web, whether it's on your phone, tablet, desktop. Everybody uses it as a form of communication, information, knowledge, um, courses, etc. It's just, it's not what it was in 1991 when it first came out. Um, the technology has grown immensely. Um, and with the technology that is growing, um, the assistive technology, such as the screen readers, special keyboards, visual mice, people that can't use a mouse, they would have to use a keyboard only. There's an immense amount of incredible technologies out there that will allow you um, or allow anybody with a disability to be able to access the web and enjoy it like the rest of us that are sighted, that can use a keyboard and don't have cognitive problems. Okay, so... Um, and stay in line with that. So with website accessibility, what is it about the website that needs to be accessible? Well, bottom line, it's the code. Your code needs to be properly built with accessibility in mind, and that's what the guidelines, WCAG 2 level A, double A, and I'll get into that a little further. But there's a functional side of it, too. Can someone that's using that assistive technology, can they access that entire site? As I mentioned, can they enjoy everything that you're presenting to the public? Um, to fill out forms, images with meaningful text. Can I make a purchase? Can I get from your um, your your logo to, um, if you're an e-commerce site, from your logo to your product, to choose my product, to the product detail page, make a purchase? The, all of these forms and all of these functionalities need to be accessible. So pretty much the goal is to have all websites accessible so that people with these disabilities can acquire their information, enjoy those same activities that the, everybody else is doing, and be active producers as well as consumers um, in this, in, with the sites. Who is affected? This number may surprise you, um, but there's one in five people with visual, auditory, physical, speech, cognitive, neurological, and other disabilities. Um, those, one in five people in the U.S., that's a lot of uh, individuals that are being excluded from being able to use the web with their assistive technologies. Um, the assistive technologies that they use are comprised of screen readers, braille displays, and even devices. Um, there's some really cool technology out there that allows eye movement to entirely replace a keyboard and a mouse usage. So it's not just someone that's visually impaired or blind. It's also the person in the wheelchair that may be paralyzed, that doesn't have use of their arms, that can visually look at a, and the um, technology can follow their eye and their eye movement so that they then in regards can participate in the, everything that is the web. Um, the technology, um, as uh, Steve had mentioned, the, the law has not kept up with technology, not by a long shot. The technology is growing incredibly fast, and by, with that growing and the law not keeping up to it, that's why we are in the situation that we are in right now. Um, who is affected? I had mentioned one in five people are affected by this. So you have blind, low vision, which equates to um, 1.2.8, uh, 
photosensitive epilepsy, something that's flashing too fast on your website. That needs to be removed. Age-related impairments. That's the fastest growing one right now. We're all getting older. We're all baby boomers. And we all grew up using the web. We want to continue to use the web. So it really needs to be, um, you really need to keep cognizant of that. Hearing, mobility, and cognitive. There's a whole business side to website accessibility. So one in five, that equates to approximately 55 million individuals, one billion globally, living with disabilities that may use assistive technology to access the web. This group of individuals in the U.S. alone have a discretionary spending power of $220 billion. If you are a company that are looking to acquire a new marketing, um, a new group to market to or a new audience, that's an enormous marketing. So if you have a website that is accessible, you're going to be able to attract a new market, a literally untapped market right now. It's also estimated that the size of this disability community is equal to that of the U.S. Hispanic market. So that kind of gives you a perspective of this entire market that is literally being ignored. Now, there's also a positive side to this. As your website becomes more and more accessible, your SEO rankings are going to be going up. Google, any of these search engines, they're like readers. They address your website like a reader. So this has got a very positive side to it as well. Um, you know, and, and the other thing is, and we've heard this over and over again by um, a few companies, that when your website is not accessible, the consumers with disabilities will go away, and with them, they will take their family and friends because they will um, talk and they will tell you others that, you know, I couldn't access, I couldn't go buy my Christmas presents because here, I couldn't register for class here, I couldn't get to um, read the local news here. And it is, it's just, and, and as Neil and Steve, it is right now looked at as a legal requirement. Oh, that's time out here. Um, did I go back so far? No, okay. Um, so the guidelines. The guidelines that are put forth by the World Wide Web Consortium Group are called WCAG2, um, and they're in version 2, which they are trying to keep ahead of and keep up with the technology. So these guidelines are the guidelines that are used around the globe. Everybody, every other country um, adheres to these as well. So these guidelines, there's a series, it's a series of measurable web guidelines um, that um, are separated in four principles, perceivable, operable, understandable, and robust. So the first one, perceivable, um, that's anything that is available on your website through sight, hearing, or touch. For example, images need alternative text or non-text content. Um, if you have with links, links need to have a proper labeling in front of them. Captions and other alternatives for any other media that you have. If you have any videos on your website, they, they need to include, include closed captioning. Um, and content can be pre presented in so many different ways, um, and that content is easier to see and hear. Offerable. User interface and navigation has to be operable. So, for example, this would address keyboard use only, tabbing through a website. Can I get, using my keyboard, can I get and navigate through your entire website? Can I get to the information? Um, this one right here, content does not cause seizures. If you have something that's flashing really, um, I think it's, um, I forget how many point, uh, things per second, um, it, it can cause a seizure. seizure. This is included in the guidelines. Understandable it has to be user friendly and easy to comprehend. Now, this is something that yes, it is part of the guidelines and it is for individuals with disabilities. However, if your website is follows these guidelines and is more user friendly to comprehend and understand, absolutely, you will be getting more people, the sighted people and the individuals with um, no dis do not have disabilities. They will get through your website and it functions much better. Robust. It has to work across all browsers, assistive technologies, mobile devices, old browsers, etc. Your website has to keep up with the browsers and with the technology, um, and that is this is a this is a bigger um, a big issue here that we see on websites that are very old. Um, when I say old, five five plus years or six years old, um, and even on the mobile devices too, because a lot of the um, or the mobile apps. 
when the mobile apps were first came out, they, a lot of them did not um, build them with accessibility in mind, so now they're having to go back and kind of uh, retune them a little bit. The guidelines. These are the guidelines from um, W3C. There are 12 of them. Now, under, in, within each one of these guidelines are 61 checkpoints. When you're going to have your website audited, um, it should be done by a computer automated and a manual review. Both of those audits have to check against every single one of these guidelines and every single one of these checkpoints. For example, guideline 1.1 deals with t um, text alternatives, time-based media, adaptable, uh, distinguishable, keyboard accessible, um, in, uh, you have to make sure that individuals have enough time. If they can't be timed out, if you have a response time for someone to submit a form, it has to give them enough time to fill it out and to um, submit. Seizures, navigation, readable, predictable, input assistance, com uh, compatible. So with all of those guidelines, now those are the guidelines and the checkpoints. And those guidelines and checkpoints, once a website is built, that will we give um, someone that's coming to the website with um, assistive technology the ability to go in and read and get through everything on your website. Some of the different types of assistive technologies that there are is JAWS, Job Access with Speech, this is a screen reader, NVDA, Non-Visual Desktop Access. This is a free one. This one is put out by Freedom Scientific, and it is a software download. NVDA, I believe, is, is a... Um, and this is a, a free one, and um, that's a screen reader as well. Windows Eyes Professional, another good one, and of course, Dragon. Naturally speaking, that is for um, someone with hearing problems. Um, so, you have all this information, um, and you want to make sure that your website is accessible. What we recommend is be proactive. Don't wait for a letter or um, someone to complain to you about your website. If you take the active, the, the proactive stance, you'll be way ahead of the ball game. You also won't be having it crammed down your throat um, where you can actually take the time. So when you want to be react proactive, you need to implement an accessibility program. And by that, then it means have a plan in place that you can follow. Designate an accessibility officer or, or, or project manager. It doesn't, the title can change, but have someone within your organization that is responsible for the accessibility web, the website being accessible. Develop a realistic plan for addressing these issues that are found. Be realistic. We, when we do an audits on sites, we can find thousands of issues. It's not something that is going to be done like in a month or two months' time. This is something that you need to have a plan in place, timelines, and run it just like any other project so that you have the timelines and the um, due dates and, and you're able to follow them. Another thing that we find a lot is that you, um, a lot of companies don't have an accessibility statement page on their website. If you don't have one, contact obviously your council but for the verbiage, but make sure you have one of these on your website. You want to let the world know that you are, number one, aware of, of um, website accessibility. You are um, have a cons an effort to bring it to accessibility. What are you doing? How are you coding it? How are, what rules are you following? Um, put that out there. And on that page, make sure that you have a, a phone number, a direct phone number, and an email address that will go to uh, anyone that does have an issue that they'll have the ability to go through and contact whomever is responsible for that. And also to stay current on industry regulations and legislation laws, and that's once again where um, Neil, Steve, and, and the Bureau, that's where we come into play. We are all over this, and anytime anything little happens, and of course with the federal government, it always is little teeny things that happen. You have to be aware of it. Um, also, being proactive, website accessibility is not a one-and-done deal. Has, it's something that has to get baked into your organization, that you have, it, have that plan, you're working your plan, you're doing the audit, you're fixing the issues, and that you are um, following the ongoing maintenance. When you are proactive, well, how do you do it? <laughs> you can you have detect, report, resolve, and prevent. So you 
um, detect it, you need a comp comprehensive audit. An audit is, as I had mentioned earlier, you, it's two-phased. First is automated, where a computer would go in and scan your website against all the WCAG2 rules. That An automated scan will typically find 28 to 30 percent top of the issues on your website. The second part of the audit is manual review. A human that will literally go into your website and use it, uh, someone that is blind using assistive technology, keyboard only, visual impairment, hearing, um, someone that will go in and t against all of those WCAG2 guidelines that I just showed you, go in and test your website and use it and see if they what barriers they come up with. Now, once they've gone in and done all that testing, you need a report. Well, we, you need to have a report that will show you what the issue is, where it is, and how to fix it. So that built-in suggested remediation. It's a new area for a lot of developers and a lot of companies with websites, so you really need to um, be able to understand what you need to do to fix it, and that's where the built-in suggested remediation comes into play. Resolve. Um, prioritize those issues. Um, what do you fix first? What are the most glaring issues on your website? What are all the issues that um, reside in my style sheets? Where is, what about my scripts? So if you can get it, have it um, comprised and organized in such a way that you can literally just hand it to a developer and say, okay, here it is. Here's, my re here's our report that we just had done. Now we need to go in and fix it. Prevent. Absolutely. So um, based on um, what the DOJ and the litigation that they've, um, and the settlements, it's pretty much the same right across the board what they've been advising companies to do. And this obviously the first, um, the top part of it, but prevent. Um, as I had mentioned, it's not a, website accessibility is not a one and done deal. Uh, what they recommend is t um, quarterly tests and manual tests as needed. Quarterly tests are done by the computer, automated testing. And what that does is it helps you follow your progress. It helps you understand where you're going. It also will detect detect trends. So, for example, if your website, if all of a sudden you're seeing, oh, my goodness, we have a lot of images that are missing alt tags again. What's going on there? What has changed? Did someone new start, did someone new start um, a new job there that is not familiar with this? So it gives you that ability to check, check um, all of your, um, everything that's being done on your website in a quarterly fashion. So as I had mentioned, testing manual review is extremely important. Having those humans types going in there, using assistive technologies to, to go through, create specific use case scenarios, such as creating the membership, registering for class, ordering projects, or just gathering specific information. Um, one of the questions I believe was, does your website, if you have an informational website or if you have a, um, an e-commerce store, does it make a difference? Our answer, is, as far as the Bureau is concerned, is no. A website is a website. There's always something specific that a person comes to your website for, whether it's to gather information or to make purchases um, or to sign up for classes. You need to make sure that every, all of those use cases that you have on, in your website are tested against those guidelines. Yes, you can test um, through the code, but any functionality that you have on your website has to be tested because you may have, say, a product page and a, uh, um, a, a product a, a category page and a product page. They two those two pages may be accessible. However, the connection between them may not. There may be a barrier there. That's a reason why it does need to be checked. Um, different things that you have to check within a website. And these are just a very few headings, images, audio, link text. Um, text sizing, field labels, keyboard. These are only a few. Um, there are many more, but these are the manual, some of the manual um, issues that do need to be checked. So the process. Now, so, um, when, with, the, with the ongoing process, step one is to analyze your, your information. You need to make sure that you're checking against all of the WCHE2 level A and double A guidelines. And I say the a and AA guidelines because this is what the DOJ has said in their settlements. And once again, we try to follow what they're driving this, so we try to follow them. Create the test points. What are those test points? What is that functionality within your website? Test all of those. Create those rules and use cases um, because that's an important part. You know, you've got this great website, but where are the barriers? Are there any barriers? 
analyze it with the automated tools it uses with disabilities. And then once that all of that has been tested, um, you need to, and, and all of that information from all that, those two testing, the automated and the manual testing, well then all that information needs to go to an industry expert in a programmer who will then put those reports together and aggregate all of that data that has been. So you have all the individual testers and in the middle is the, the final report. Um, so you have a programmer, you may have an industry expert, someone keyboard only, NVDA, JAWS, et cetera. So we go through and we have to put it all, um, all of that information together. And then we, that all needs to be comprised in a report that is prioritized and easy to understand and tell you where to start. Um, and that with, that's with all the remediation techniques are added um, by these accessibility experts and programmers so that you literally, um, your programmers can, or your uh, your um, the company that may be taking care of your website has the ability to go in and address any issues that are found. And once again, that final report will come out for you to um, hand that off to um, whomever is responsible for going in and doing that. Now, you've gone all through all the testing and you've identified, you know, what needs to be fixed and how to fix it. Well, the, you also need to make sure that you have a team in place who is going to implement the web fix. Does Do they, and does that team or individual, do they need training? Do they know how to use jobs? Do they know what the, uh, the best practices are for coding? So you need to make sure that you um, empower, and we do this, we make sure that we like to make sure that your organization is empowered once we're done, that you have the ability to take your website um, and, and maintain it yourself. Um, that, that I would advise that get your team trained Make sure they know the best practices. Let them learn, even if they are not someone that is blind or visually impaired. Have them train, say, on, on JAWS, so that as you create new web pages and as you start to create new areas within your website, or if you find maybe an area that's not working properly, you have the ability then to go in and test it yourself. If you're having issues, yes, then a consultant would come in and um, you know set up a user um, web-based route for you. Step four, definitely schedule the frequency of automated. Um, however you do this, that's your ongoing maintenance. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, it's not a one and done deal. Um, you have to make sure this is something that's baked in and you, and you understand what needs to be done from the point of um, addressing the, finding the issues, addressing the issues, and ongoing maintenance. And then, of course, I had mentioned the training. Training is very important um, for anybody that is coding or anybody that has anything to do with maintaining websites. The more knowledge, obviously, the more power you have over um, following all of this. And with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Neil. Thank you, Kim. Very informative. So we have a couple of questions that are, um, are somewhat related, and I would encourage anyone who um, is still on the phone or on the webinar uh, to ask any op any questions that they may have, I realize we're a minute past the hour, so we'll we'll try to get through this quickly. Um, the the first question is: Is it safe to assume that a standard website platform such as WordPress is properly coding for ADA accessibility? And I, I'm gonna I'm gonna ask Kit for Kim's thoughts on this, but my my initial reaction is no. It's it's not safe to assume. Um, that readily available uh, website platforms, whether it's WordPress or others, um, are, are ADA compliant. Um, and I think that it requires some level of investigation um, with that particular provider uh, to determine what that means. And I would also add that the, the coding for the website itself may be ADA compliant, but that doesn't necessarily mean that the content that you display when you build that website and how you display that content will necessarily be um, available to the disabled. So with that, I'll, I'll hand it off to, to Kim uh, for her thoughts on that. Yes, um, you're absolutely correct in that. Um, WordPress does a wonderful job um, of their base, but once that base is taken and um, created and a website is created from it, that's where we see things happening. That's where we see the disconnect. Um, and it is also has the content as well as you mentioned, but yes. It, I would def it does it's just because the their templates and their open source is um, uh, great um, but once it's once it's um, built out that's when you see things happening 
Uh, this is Steve Embry. I would also add to that it's a worthwhile uh, exercise to check your contracts that you may have with web developers and see uh, what is included and, and what may be excluded from their obligations. Many of the uh, vendors and developers have a way of excluding things that uh, sometimes you might think are uh, are not excluded. So it's a, a worthwhile exercise to check those agreements. And certainly if you're any of our web developer clients, um, probably make sure that they are excluded to the extent that you are <laughs> providing work that's uh, compliant with the ADA. Uh, a related question to WordPress was um, on YouTube videos. Um, and what if you're using a video that is hosted through YouTube? And I think the question there is, um, to the extent that uh, the ADA compliance would be needed with respect to that video, let's say uh, closed captioning or what have you, um, what do you do in those instances? Um, Kim, any thoughts on that? Yeah, absolutely. I'll take that one. Um, YouTube has a great feature on there where you can put in the closed captioning, um, and, and you can do it. They, they've got a great feature on there. We've used it um, on one of our websites, um, one of our earlier websites, um, that it is a, there's a feature right on there that you have the ability to go in and put your own closed captioning in. So uh, the, the, I think the long and short of it there is to make sure that um, um, to make sure that you're actually taking advantage of those options that are available. Uh, another question is another question is how is 508 compliance related? Um, 508, I believe, is the section under the ADA that applies to federal agency and government entities. Um, the DOJ's approach with respect to um, those sites is that they must be ADA compliant, and they do uh, point towards the WCAG guidelines um, for for what it means to be accessible. Uh, Kim, did I get that right? Yeah, I can. I'm just going to elaborate on that a little bit. The Section 508 guidelines came out as, a, as an amendment to the ADA in 1998. Those guidelines, Section 508, were specifically for the federal government and some and to state levels at some point. Um, the federal government at some point decided with um, it, it filtered down to vendors where they expected their vendors um, who were ever supplying anything for the federal government was compliant to Section 508. Those guidelines came out in 1998. They're old. They're antiquated. Their supposed access board is supposedly doing a refresh on them. Everybody in the industry is hoping that they harmonize with UCAG2 and follow what the DOJ's um, steps have been so far. Excellent. Thank you. Um, one question for you specifically, Kim. What product would you recommend using? And product for what? Good question. Am I, am I, my sense of the question is maybe as a auditing software, uh, what product might you recommend using? Uh, hopefully the person who asked the question can provide a follow-up if that's not it. Uh, yeah, well, as far as there are many um, tools, there are many tools that are out there. Some are free, some are, are paid. Um, some tools, um, and these, once again, these are automated um, that will, they may, like uh, Webbing, great tool, um, WCAG2, they have a great tool, but they're one page at a time. There are other tools out there, are included, that will grab an entire website and scan it, um, and, and there, there's some really good ones. I can't stress enough, though, that it's only going to detect 28 to 30 percent of the issues on your site, so do not rely just on that solely. You absolutely will need that manual review. Steve, did you have something to add? Yeah, to I, uh, previously there was a question, of, and I think it was something along the lines of, isn't it a foregone conclusion that the ADA does apply to websites? And uh, uh, I guess, and I think Neil's answer was it depends, which is certainly true, but uh, the bottom line is that there are several circuits, federal district courts, or federal courts of appeals that have said it does not, and certain courts of appeals that says it does. And often in those instances, the U.S. Supreme Court will look at the conflict and take a case to decide it. Now, two weeks ago, we had a Supreme Court that by a vote of five to four was very pro-business. Uh, now we have a Supreme Court that, uh, you know, maybe four to four uh, and an unknown future as to who the next appointee. My, my point of that is that you know, once you become involved in, in one of these lawsuits, you have to evaluate 
the cost of resolving the case and complying with what uh, what needs to be complied with with the risk and and in some instances given your business uh, and type of risk that you have you may indeed conclude that it's worth trying to to take one of these cases and trying to to litigate it and and win it on the other hand you may not so it's a very all of these uh, sort of litigation resolution issues are case de dependent, uh, and in some cases you, you you fight, and in some cases you don't. And I'd also say, in, in terms of, of, of pre-suit activity, uh, what you might do now, uh, keep in mind that what the ADA requires is reasonable access, and what may be reasonable for a, a, a multinational uh, retailer like Target may not necessarily be reasonable for the locally owned neighborhood bar around the corner. So th there's a lot of individual issues and questions that, that have to be considered uh, in, this, in this arena. And uh, you know, I urge, urge you, if you have questions, uh, uh, to, to really seek out uh, good, sound, legal, and technical advice. So if I may just interject yeah, one thing, I, I just interject one thing, um, and I'm sure a lot of um, your your clients have this question. Well, what does it cost? Um, and, and a cost on here, and it is strictly dependent <clears throat> upon the complexity of a website. <clears throat> Someone that has a very complex website, such as a college or higher ed online courses, e-commerce sites. Will cost. Well, it, there are more man hours that are needed to go in and identify those issues as opposed to just a marketing site. So please keep that in mind when you're out there interviewing your vendors. Um, it is based literally based on um, complexity of website. Thank you, Kim. Uh, so a couple more questions here for those that want to uh, stay on. Um, one question is, who has responsibility to maintain website accessibility if a third party develops and hosts its own platform? Um, so this would be a scenario in which a third party develops and hosts a, a company's platform, is I, how I'm reading this question. Um, the first response to that would be certainly that the company that's offering the website will be the one that's um, targeted to the extent that there's going to be any activity. It's the one with the brand associated with the website. Now, from a putting putting aside whether we're dealing with a um, or outside of the context of dealing with federal government websites or state government websites, um, I think the answer here largely uh, um, focuses on what do the contracts provide between. Uh, the, the, the website operator developer and um, the individual company for whom the website was built. Uh, what you'll oftentimes see in website development deals is no reference to ADA compliance. In fact, in most instances, the references to um, specific laws are oftentimes confined to a general rep and warranty by both sides that each will comply with all applicable federal, state, and local laws. So there's a bit of ambiguity there, of course, as to what that means in this context. Um, and I think there is a fair bit of um, activity that's likely to occur here once liability starts to hit um, kind of more thoroughly across the board rather than in snippets to individual brands. So once we see more wide-scale um, activity um, going after private companies, you're probably going to see a number of those companies start turning and looking to uh, how to defer some of those costs. And that may well be through uh, focus on website development deals, um, what the third parties provided under those deals, and and whether they were responsible for compliance. Um, if I'm, Kim, do you have any right, thoughts I'm, on that one? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, if, if when, we're, when we're auditing websites, there's a third-party software that um, an, an, a company is using. For example, it may be credit card payment, it may be um, online course or something. Your, we audit your website. Your website, we will do those use cases. Within those use cases, some of them will take us to that third-party software that you are using. And when we get to that point, when we find barriers within there, we will report them back to you. But you, the website owner, will not have access to that code. It is the responsibility of that third-party vendor to find you that software. They have to go in and fix their own code because you, website owner, do not have access to that. Excellent point. Excellent point. Uh, another question here is what, and, and this is a this is one that we hear certainly from some of our clients, which is, um, what do you do if you really have an 
uh, allocated a budget uh, to dealing with the upgrades and the modifications that may be needed uh, to bring your site in compliance with the WCAG guidelines or uh, to take other steps to uh, bring it in compliance with the ADA. Um, whether that's lack of budget on a yearly basis or lack of a budget period, um, I think that, and I'm going to hand it over to Kim because she receives from our uh, earlier discussion, I know that she receives this question quite a bit. Um, I think that largely it's planning for it. Um, if you're in that scenario where nothing immediate can really be done from a practical perspective, I would, I would first say that actually some things can be done with little to no cost, such as implementing a website accessibility policy um, and taking certain other nominal steps. But I think then it's also building into, and this is step two, building into your future planning, um, certain upgrades, certain modifications that you, that, that you are locking into making as time goes on. Um, Kim, any thoughts on that one? Uh, absolutely. With, with this too, and this is always a tough one, for a smaller organization, um, it, you can start with the free tools that are out there and check your website based on a computer. Um, check your website. Um, the larger the company, the more visible you are and the more of a target you are. Um, as far as budgeting it in, yes, you can go all in all at once. You can break it down into segments. Um, just make sure, that the, and this is how we recommend, you have that accessibility statement page up. You let them know what you're doing. You are a small organization. We are working um, towards being compliant. Um, we're checking images. Blah, blah, blah. I mean, you can just put whatever you want up there, but just do something. Don't not do anything. There are free tools out there that you can that can assist you. Um, there are consultants, and us is one. We can go to your website and find the five top um, pages, your home page, and maybe a submit form that will absolutely need to be manually reviewed. And we can break it down in such a way that it's more digestible. And then, of course, the larger companies, um, I I can't recommend enough just a full full blown audit and and really go for everything. Thank you. So we'll take one more question here, and I'll, I'll read off. What audiences does this apply to, B2C, B2B, internal employees, all? Um, from my perspective, the answer is all. Uh, certainly B2C and B2B. The internal employees, of course, uh, the ADA does apply to um, employer-employee uh, relationships. Uh, Kim, have you um, had any experience in dealing with kind of intranet sites um, that are available to uh, employees only and how those are dealt with under the ADA? Uh, those are considered, those are the same thing. It's, it's the intranet. Um, by you not having um, an intranet that is accessible to everyone, you are preventing people from being employed or people from doing their job. That's discrimination. So it does apply to everything. Excellent. Right now, the big right now the big focus is on the public side, but um, for all the larger companies out there that are listening, it applies to anything digital, all digital media. Great. Well, it's time to uh, we've gone a good fifteen minutes, sixty minutes after the time, and so I'm going to end this webinar. Uh, if you had questions that weren't answered, please do follow up with us. We'll make every effort to follow up with you as well. Um, and uh, otherwise, thank you for uh, joining us. Kim, I want to thank you for participating. Uh, very good information, in your, um, and that information is very much appreciated. Steve, thank you for joining. And until next time, uh, thank you very much, everyone. Have a great day. Bye.